Well, welcome to Guitar Tales. How you doing? Hi, Dave. Great to uh, great to be here. I'm doing very well, thanks. How are you? I am fantastic, thanks. So this is historic. You are our <laughs> first guest ever with a cool accent. And That's you'll cool. say we have an accent, I'm sure. This, uh, the new British invasion. It is, it is. You're, you're, you're resurging it. <laughs> yeah. So you are Johnny Nick and your band, I love this name, Johnny Bullet and the Promise. Yes, yeah. So Johnny Nick is, um, is kind of a, a nickname from John Nicholson, which is my name. But I know Jack Nicholson's got a cool name. Um, he'd already, that's already been taken. So... Yeah. I never thought that John Nicholson was particularly cool for rock and roll, so uh, Johnny Bullet appeared. Um, but there is a story behind it. Oh, I want to hear it. Let's hear it. Well, it's, it's brief. I mean, it's, um, I had a, uh, a covers band in London. Um, so I, I'm from Blackpool. There's a place near, near Liverpool. So um, obviously Liverpool has got a famous music history. Don't need to go into that. Neil Diamond is from there, right? That's him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Stones. The Stones are from there, apparently. <laughs> um, so uh, in London, um, we had a, a covers band that were, were called The Bullets. So we, we used to have this, we used to play like old Sex Pistols and The Clash and right. Johnny Cash and all these different kind of rock and roll and punk songs. Um, and we kind of took that, uh, you know, the Ramones, how they had, they were always like Johnny Ramone and Joey Ramone. So we, we, we kind of, when we played, we called each other like Johnny Bullet or All right. Andy Bullet. Or we had a, we had a, funnily enough, our drummer was from Liverpool. So he became Ringo, obviously. So he was Ringo Bullet. Um, so, so the Johnny Bullet thing just, just kind of stuck. And then I started doing a few open mics and thought, well, I'll, I'll just do it under the Johnny Bullet alias. And then, uh, and that's where the band then came from. And, and you know what I like? I'm thinking about it for the first time now. The second half of your name and the promise. And, and yeah. what a really cool, positive minded. It's almost a pledge you're making to your audience, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way of, of looking at it. And I think that was to try and be positive. I mean, there was always a um, I guess I was I, I could I was thinking initially of maybe just being the promise and just keeping it as a band name. But because um because we're old uh and the guys that are in the band you know they like to do stuff like sometimes play golf or mow the lawn or do something right 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 rock and roll. so so i'll go and play i don't like to do any of those things so i'll i'll just carry on playing on my own so i thought well i'll, I'll keep the johnny bullet piece and I, i'm writing all the the lyrics and all the music uh and we'll bring the band together when we get the opportunity to to play live but yeah the i the intent was that we keep it positive, we keep it uplifting, we try and have a strong message in the music. So, you know, the name seemed to fit with the, with the output in many but, ways. And, and I have a certain affinity for names like that, I'm realizing now. So one of my bands in college, um, we had th two or three originals and the rest were covers. So I was annoyed with that. So I came up with the name, we were John Doe and the Generics. <laughs> okay. Which is exactly the opposite of the positivity yeah. and creativity. Yeah, the generics. But, yeah, I quite like the, um, I mean, obviously like the Tom Petty, you know, like the, yeah. the Heartbreak. Yeah. And, yeah, and the, the Black Hearts and stuff like that. They're kind of rock and roll names. All right, Joan Jett, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's, it's uh, I guess there's a little bit of history to follow, but you're right. Um, sending out a positive message, especially in these times, that's, yeah. uh, that's kind of what we need. Well, when we eventually get there, that's what I really do want to talk a bit about these times. Um, but just as a segue into it, we'll, we'll at some point uh, when we post this, well, you have a great promo video of your band. Yeah. And it, I watched it before I read your little, I think you sent it an email, you sent me some copy. And I mm -hmm. couldn't put my finger on who you were reminding me of. And then I read your copy and you guys really, there's a lot of clash in you because you, you know, yeah. you referenced Joe Strummer, but Yeah. Thank you. No, I mean, I appreciate that. And, and I guess, you know, Joe Strummer was, um, it's funny, a, a kind of a new song. And uh, I, within the lyrics, I talk about how, you know, of another time, you, you probably remember it the same when you used to walk into town to go and buy the actual record. There was, you know, there was such, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There, there was um, ritual. There was such ritual. Yeah. Yeah, about, absolutely. you know, pulling through, you know, like going to the record stacks, you, you regard the cover art, you look at the back. Yeah, 100%. And, and that's what, um, you know, 
London Calling is the album that springs to mind. And I can yeah. remember walking into the record store, feeling very uncool because I was a kid and there was lots of punks in the store and I probably had my school uniform on. And oh, I went and bought funny. the record and I walked back home, reading, you know, reading the gatefold sleeve, reading, pulling out, looking at the lyrics. And uh, the lyrics were really powerful. And I think that was probably the first, it was like, you know, there was no social media, so there was nowhere to get your news. Other no. Than and in a newspaper. So, and nobody, kids didn't read newspapers, but we read the lyrics of, yeah. of, bands, of bands that we felt were important. And uh, The Clash were a huge influence. And even in the, you know, Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros, I don't know if you've caught up with them. He had a band uh, before. No. And the Mas Mescaleros, they released three albums. Fabulous, you know, a bit more, um, a little bit more tempered in terms of the music, but the lyrics were still strong, you know? So uh, he's always been a big influence. You know, I remember when they, I, you know, when you talk about The Clash, right? I could picture us all in high school. We were, you know, all my friends and I played guitar. My, my yeah. friend Jason's, we would sit in his bedroom. There would be always one, two few guitars for the guys. So we'd all be fighting over a guitar. There'd usually be like two guitars, three guys, three, three guitars, four guys, whatever. But when that album came out, it, it, it kind of changed everything. Yeah, it had so many different musical styles. If you go back to it now, you know that there's jazz on there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few like piano ballads like Card Cheat. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of reggae influence there always was with The Clash. So yeah. they, they were a little bit ahead of the time. And, um, you know, it's a shame the way things worked out. And particularly, I mean, Joe was only, I think, 50 or so when, when he passed. And uh, yeah. you can't think of all the great music that potentially was still to come. Um, it, it is. And what do you think, because I, I can't put my finger on it, but there was something more accessible about The Clash than the obvious comparison, which is The Pistols, right? Yeah. You know, I don't know what it is. Well, I think... I think the pistols for me were a little bit more, they were a bit cartoon like when you think yeah. of them. They, they represented everything that was punk, but without the message. And right. They, they were they just a, angry. Yeah, they were kind of angry. And they had a few, you know, God Save the Queen and Pretty Vacant. They're all great songs. And in fact, the covers band that I used to play in, you know, we used to play those songs. And, I, and I'd never get tired of playing. Well, Pretty Anarchy Vacant. is it's one of the Anarchy greatest rock songs ever written. Yeah, but it wasn't, you know, there was something a bit more meaningful about The Clash. Um, yeah. Of course, they, they had a, a bit more longevity. You know, the pistols came and went in the blink of an eye and, yeah. and The Clash took around a little bit longer. And perhaps things could have been different. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they would have reformed at some point and uh, that yeah. would have been quite something. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Who fanatic and I know The Clash were all about The Who. You know, yeah, they... they were big fans. Yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, I saw... Uh, Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros support the Who in, oh, really? uh, in Manchester. So that was my only. I, I kind of missed the Who and classic rock. That was just kind of passed me by. I was my my. You know, I I grew up in a great time in the UK of of, of the punk era. You know, yeah, seventy seven. So the kind of classic rock piece. I'm, I feel quite thankful. I've not. I never quite got that. But uh, punk onwards was always big for me. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's, it was a really cool sort of answer. There was, you know, I like progressive also, but I thought yeah. they were a great answer to Kansas and yes. Yeah. I love yeah. yes. But a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of Clash people w would hate yes. They'd hate ELP and bands like that. Yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that, um, I mean, my, my tastes are pretty diverse as well because, you know, I, I could appreciate the musicality of, of a lot of those bands yeah. without, you know, without really wanting the, the lyrics. The, the thing about those, the, the lyrics might have been memorable because there might have been a catchy hook, but uh, I didn't feel the, any kind of message coming out of it. So yeah. I think- it, and John Anderson it, says he doesn't even know what they meant. <laughs> he says that. He doesn't know what those lyrics meant. I can believe it, which, yeah. which kind of took me on and, you know, obviously, it's a good time to be talking to you on Bruce's birthday because there was a natural progression from, you know, the clash and the lyrical bite that they had and the message to, you know, Springsteen and yeah. the lyricality there as well. So I've always been, that, that's been something that I've always been drawn to and which I've tried to reflect in, in the music that I make. Yeah, and that's the other comparison I saw in your write-up that as I thought about it, I really heard in your music is Bruce 
Yeah. And he's, you know, talk about, you know, in a sting-like way, but in a different way. He He's aged perfectly oh. with his art, you know? Yeah, I I, um, I mean, I admire, I know the, the Rolling Stones have been kind of rolling on their Greatest Hits tour forever. And I think they released a couple of things maybe this year, which was new, which was quite refreshing. But the thing that you've got to love about Bruce is how he keeps he keeps going and he keeps digging deep and finding something new. Yeah, you know, he's, he's still got something to say. He's still relevant and musically. I mean, the Western Stars album, I, I didn't really get at first and it was a real slow burn for me. And then I saw yeah. the movie uh, and him explaining the songs and the inspiration behind the songs. And then it, it took on a new meaning. So I kind of refound him again on that album. Yeah, he's, you know, I, I saw him four or five years ago, maybe. Um, and, and to hear the rising live, yeah, you know, and, and to hear, you know, in 2001, one could have written him off at yeah. that point. You know, he wasn't a kid in 2001 anymore. Yeah. And he wrote a meaningful song about 9-11 that was as powerful as anything he had written in the late 70s yeah. or more. Again, the whole of that album lyrically is, is just incredible, you know, so... There's nobody else that could have pulled off an album like that without it feeling, you know, cliched and awkward. Right, um, or, or even forced. I yeah, will finish in on a tragedy, and that, that's not him. Yeah, no, it, 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 was, it was so natural, and uh, it's an absolute, you know, it's an absolute gift, isn't it? You know, yeah. and, uh, I was fortunate enough to see him on the Broadway show, and uh, I, was in, I was an emotional wreck at the end of that. I was exhausted. I it was incredible, you know, the, the, hearing him tell his own story personally in his own words was, was just wonderful. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I will, I, I, in that same vein, um, the last time I saw him was shortly after Clarence passed. Right. And I think it, uh, maybe Rosalita, there, one of their songs uh, that has a sax solo, what they did for a handful of, of concerts within a tour, the, the sta they would just be silent. He stopped. It, yeah. Was it the 10th crowd Avenue would roar? What's that? Yeah. Was it Tenth Avenue freeze out? That's and what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. And the and the, the screen went bright and there was an image of Clarence. Yeah. And right now, I don't know if the camera could pick it up. I have good yeah, yeah. I cried, yeah. like not like weeping, but yeah. I felt the love of yeah. twenty thousand people loving this this huge man who who yeah. had a gigantic footprint. I have, I still have goosebumps talking about it. Yeah, I know. And and because it, it caught me so off guard, and and it and it was love on the stage, and it was love in the audience, and you just had this whole stadium of love, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and what a great tribute, you know. It was, and, and he did very much the same thing within the Broadway show. You know, he, there was a big segment on Clarence, you know, how the band got together, and it's about his parents, and there were so many highs and lows. And the great thing about it, though. It, it could have been any of us, you know, he was telling a story that you could relate to, that I could relate to. We've all got, you know, families, we've all got issues and problems and, you know, his like hopes and dreams and failures. And, and it, it was like he was, he could have been any one of us and he was telling not just his story, but he was telling our story as well. And, you know, that's a gift. There's not many yeah. people that could, that could do that. No. And, and, and he is, and this is, this is my, uh, not so, um, not so thinly veiled segue. He is what you are. He's a poet who's a musician, <laughs> you know? That, and, that's very kind of you to say. <laughs> and it's true. And, but, but, you know, what I like is what, what, what you infuse in all your descriptors in, in your art is the words, the lyrics. Um, yeah. And it's not that you're going to poo-poo or dislike a well-crafted melody with some silly little lyrics, but what, what, what speaks to your heart and then what you emote through your music are meaningful lyrics. Like that's your thing. Yeah. Thank, I, I mean, you know, look, there's no way you can be talking in the same breath as, as sort of Bruce or Joe Strummer. Um, I think I put in the note back to you. There's a guy called Frank Turner. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't get to Google him. I don't know him. Yeah, worth, worth checking out because he's, um, he's, uh, I think he's another big Springsteen fan and, uh, Bruce is a fan of his as well, but he's more of a um, like folk punk, you know, when he, he plays on his own as well and he plays with a band. Um, very exciting, very strong lyrically. He used to be in a like an emo hardcore band, so he's okay. got a vocal, a vocal range to, to die for, you know? Right, so, right. Um, 
so yeah, the, I, I think I think the lyrics are important in in to to try and get a message across about. I think it was the um, I think it was the the manager of the Clash. I think it was Bernie Rhodes that okay. used to get uh, Joe Strummer to one side and just say, you know, you've got to write what you see. You know, mm-hmm. you, that, that's all that's all you can do. And that was kind of his push that, you know, there's so many things that are affecting us at the moment. It's hard to just write about something meaningless because I, I, it's also hard to know where to start sometimes as to what subject matter to take on. But it feels that, that is a good starting point by just opening your eyes and seeing what's going on and, and, and trying to capture what you see in a, in a moment in time. You know, you just gave me the, the strangest metaphor that popped in my head. You ever see those booths at uh, fairs where someone goes into a booth and a bunch of dollar bills sort of, you know, flutter around. You try to grab as many as you can. It's a yeah. little thing. So yeah. we're going through culturally, health-wise, and in every other way, just an absolutely horrific moment in time. And for an artist, floating around like those dollars in that thing are all these emotions that you can capture. And it's yours to not, it's, it's yours to fritter away if you don't do what you just said. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's sadly an amazing time for an artist like you because you can grab a hold of just so many things that are happening. From an emotional point of view or, or socially, you can you can lend us your voice toward commentary on what you observe. Yeah, I think it, you're right. It, and, and it can go one of two ways. I, I was talking to a friend of mine who plays um, locally here in Hoboken. We were talking last week and he was almost saying sometimes he found it too difficult because the subject matter was too obvious. Yeah. You know, it, it was almost like, does anybody want to hear a, lo- a lockdown song, you know, or about, you know, COVID specifically, but it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to address COVID like in the title, but right. it can address, it can address, you know, a longing or, you know, right. when, when is this going to change? You know, are, are we another day closer to, to some form of going back to normal, you know, and wrestling with the emotions that we've all had during that period without specifically saying this is a COVID song. Yeah. You just came up with two titles, One Day Closer, <laughs> Wrestling with Emotion. <laughs> yeah. I did actually do one, funnily enough. There is one called Another Day Closer. I was thinking that as I, uh, as yeah, I said it's... it. And that's what it was about. It was literally about we, we don't know when it's going to end. We don't know where the finish line is. And that's a, that's a tough thing to mentally uh, negotiate. But we yeah. do know that we've just got through another day and we're another day closer to whenever that may be. Right. And, and your job as an artist, you know, depending on what you want to do, I, I am not a fan and I don't care if any of our listeners disagree with me of those hit you over the head with obvious lyrics songs. You know, yeah. I, I love the USA. No, <laughs> but I do, but fuck that. That's, that's not yeah. your job is to get the subtlety and the nuance of what we're going through and to give us insights. If you write a song that says, this sucks, I don't like being stuck in here, that doesn't help people, but you're gonna, do, and what you do, and I've heard it in your lyrics, is you get the nuance, the, those sort of yeah. subtle feelings. Yeah, and I think also the nuances are in, um, you know, some of the songs, I mean, <laughs> it was the songwriting that kept me sane, if I'm honest with you, and you know, I'm in my place here in Hoboken, and. Um, dare I say I play piano too? Can I, can, is this you a may. piano? You know, You're allowed on guitar tales. Well. So, so I kind of had a guitar tales, which would be my, maybe during the day where I could, you know, go in the attic and sing and shout till my heart's content and not upset anybody. Then at night time now, you know, it's going dark. It's a bit, a uh, bit more atmospheric and I could maybe play something more on the piano. And, right. uh, and it was interesting that the different, nuances of that you know for me a guitar i find it hard to write a ballad say on a guitar because i you always feel you play the guitar it's you pumped up and you you're ready to go and it's going to be something aggressive or something yes. positive. whereas on the piano i'm so miserable you know i just <laughs> every, everything is a minor key and i just found myself like when you say about sometimes the time that we've had during lockdown you know, I wrote a song about nightfalls, you know, as, as it is now, you know, as, as it's getting dark. Right. And, and because you had time, 
And because there was maybe silence that you don't appreciate because you're all, you're rushing around in your life prior to the lockdown, that there were things, subtle things that you heard about as, as it's getting darker and the noises from the street and the, the conversations in the street that you would never have, never have picked up on before, you know? So, so there were interesting little things that came out that I would probably never have even considered had it not been for the, the times that we're in. Right. You know, it's funny you, you mentioned the difference between piano and guitar. I don't know why this quote has stayed with me for 30 years, but Daryl Hall is getting interviewed and he talked about piano and he, he characterized it as a complete instrument. And he said, everyone should know piano. And he said, what I like about piano is that it's all there right in front of you. And I don't play piano and, I, and, I, and I'm, just an, I'm just an amateur guitar player. I'm not at your level, but... I thought that was such a powerful statement. And he said, all musicians should sort of pass through the piano realm. And, and yeah. it just, it lays it out. It's interesting that as well, because uh, I don't want to keep going back to Springsteen, but he plays pretty Fine. mean piano. He, he plays pretty mean piano. You know, and he's, I didn't know he, that. Yeah, he's written a lot of his songs on piano. And he, on his solo tours, he's able to play. I mean, uh, Brian Fallon, uh, of Gaslight Anthem, very, very similar. You know, they're both fantastic guitarists and songwriters, but they're both able to sometimes take the anthem, right, non guitar, and turn it into something different, intimate. And probably intimate. But as a result of it being infinite, me, in, intimate, maybe even more powerful, right? When they've taken it onto piano, and and it's it's a, you know it's a little bit softer. And you're obviously more attuned to the to the actual message that's being yeah, portrayed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you go on a YouTube rabbit trail, you know, yeah. like one of my favorite things to do is take some of my favorite songs and and and, and listen and view different iterations or covers of them. Like, won't get fooled yeah. again when when Pete, you know, he was doing all those acoustic versions of an arena rock song, right? And, and it gives, and and who did it? Richie Blackmore has. Yeah. And have you ever heard his version of Won't Get Fooled Again? No, I haven't. I mean, I know Richie Blackmore. I've heard, obviously, in the, the Rainbow and yeah, he, those days. He's quite an eccentric as well, isn't he now? Yeah, and he, did, he rearranged the whole song. And yeah. he did an amazing version of it. Yeah. And yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big fan of both. And, um, you know, whilst in an ideal world, you know, we, we could keep playing the big rock anthems with the band. Um, yeah. Of course, we don't know when the next uh, opportunity to play live will be as a band. Um, right. Or even even solo, you know, the, the open mic nights used to be the kind of lifeblood of the local sort of music community here in Hoboken and I guess yeah. ev everywhere. Um, and, you know, that's where, when I came over to New York last year, um, that's where I met my, my friends because it's such a great community, isn't it? All you need to do is turn up with a guitar and bash out two or three songs and you've made, you know, probably 10 or 12 new friends and yeah. you can do that wherever you go. It's true. Um, I love your town. And I used to spend a fair amount of time there. I love your pronunciation of your town. Why is it? Have I got it wrong? What do I say? Hoboken. Well, I, yours is better. I, I will never call it Hoboken again. It sounds so crass. <laughs> Hoboken. I love that. That's my shitty British accent. No, but, we're going back to the Austin Powers again. Yeah, that's right. We were talking about that before we... <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> but, um, no, but you're right. Music pulls people together. Music can absolutely... And, and you make friends. I've got um, this right here. This, this, is, um, this is an old picture of my buddies and oh, I wow. playing. And that's yeah. a little, we talk about it on the show. This is a little, um, what do you call a little card we put in the student center. And I have friends yeah. I've had for 35 years because yeah. we play guitar. Yeah. And, I, and these are friends I talk to multiple times a week. Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been the same. What, what was a, a joy for me putting the band together back home in the UK was um, the guitarist, uh, we've got three guitarists. It sounds it sounds a bit intense. It's a bit Thin Lizzy esque, but uh, yeah, we've got. Um, I play acoustic, and uh, got I saw two, that. Uh, lead, yeah, two lead guitars, and um, one of them uh, was in the first band that I was in, and we we kind of lost touch, so we probably hadn't seen each other for twenty five years or something like that. 
And one day I just rang him up and said, hey, Nigel, I know I've not been in contact for a while, but yeah. how do you fancy uh, getting a band together? And he's like, yeah, man, love to. It'd be great. It'd be great to catch up. And it was just like, just picked up as though, you know, there'd been no time whatsoever between them at those moments. So It's great. Uh, you yeah. got... You're literally like, it's almost like a couple having a baby together when you create music, you know, because you're, you're creating something and I'm being hokey, but not, you know, no, I think, I think that's the one thing that I miss. If I, if I had the opportunity, um, I mean, we're recording at the moment and uh, I went back to the UK uh, a couple of months ago uh, just to visit friends and family. And I, I demoed as many songs as I, as I possibly could while I was right. there and I left I left some of them with the guys to work on. So they're, they're working on a few songs right now, but it's, you're having to do things, like you're doing things virtually. So the collaboration is really difficult where yeah. there's nothing better than just being in a room with a few beers or a bottle of wine or whatever it is. And you might go over some old stuff, but then you'll just jam around or somebody will say, I've got this new idea or I've got this riff or I've, jo you know, I've got this beat or whatever it may be. And collectively seeing what comes out of that. Right. If, if, and, and if, I could, if I could do that full time for a week, I would love to see what comes out. I know. And, and even the little things like the, the ambient acoustics of a room, you know, if you're fortunate to have a tube amplifier and, and their sound is bleeding into your sound and your sound is yeah. bleeding into their sound, you physically feel it, you yeah. know, from, from the kick drum or whatever, you know. That... It is one of the best feelings. And I know we got together a few times um, to do just that while we're yeah. back. Uh, I think already in the UK, the lockdown is kind of, we're, we're experiencing sadly a bit of a second wave. So I actually don't think that if I went home now, I'd be able to do what we did back then. Right. You, can't mix, you can't mix households anymore. So, uh, so I, at least I went back at the right time. But there's a magic that happens if you've got, uh, gifted musicians with the same outlook and the yeah. same kind of positivity, then anything can happen. Yeah. And, and I guess to make the best of things, you have to make the best of things. And I think now if, if we were to assume, which I hope and think we can, that things will be better and different at some point in the relatively near future. Now you grab all those feelings and events and issues that are flying through the air and then and, and you put your artistic, emotional, authentic spin on them into a song. And then you emerge with a catalog of things you've written during a really rough time. You know, and then we could look back on it and reflect on it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. And it's, it's almost like a diary entry, isn't it? It's capturing the moment in time. Yes. But, and, it, and it was it was something that was mentioned. One of the guys said about because I got all these songs and I mean, I've probably written at least 40, maybe 50 songs wow. uh, during, during lockdown. Because uh, I, I had nothing else to do. You're doing no what friends. you should be doing now, though. Yeah, but yeah. this is what happens when you have no friends. You just keep writing songs. <laughs> uh, so, right, right, right. so I kept doing that, but it, it was interesting. I think it was both uh, Van Morrison, uh, Adele. I remember reading her uh, saying that you need to write 100 songs before you come out with anything that's worthwhile. That's, so, yeah. So, but there's a truth to it because you, even with 50 songs and they're in, you know, there's probably 40 that are finished and maybe 10 that are still work in progress or whatever, but you get to them and you, and you play them back or you play them for other people and they're not all great. Right. There are, they can't there be. Are, there are two or three That's a, maybe yeah. that you just think, wait, hang on, we're, we're really onto something here. Right. So, and, and maybe there's more than that. And, and you, there yeah, probably are. I mean, but, yeah, but I think that what the guys were trying to say is, so what's the theme? You know, almost like you said, what's the message? And it's not just um, COVID message or a lockdown or, uh, yeah. you know, the racial tension or the politics of the day or whatever it is. There's like, there's almost like some kind of theme that binds all this together. Yeah. So, so think about that. And I, that's Absolutely. something that I've been kind of wrestling with over the last few weeks since I got back. Well, and the thing is, we as a society need artists to do that for us. I mean, it's essential. Yeah. Um, you know, like, um, help me, the song, Something Happening Here, What It Is, I Can't... Um, I know the one you mean. Um, 
I, what it is ain't exactly. Signs, it's not signs, but it's. Yeah, so. I'm not sure. I know it'll come but, to us when we finished. But right, I know but, we right, as soon as we, we hit, we stop recording. But <laughs> so my point in that reference is that, so I think you and I are probably about the same age. So I was born in the 60s, but I don't remember the 60s. Sure. I hear that song and an artist brings me back to that period of time during the protests in the 60s, your yeah. job for our children and, and perhaps generations beyond them it, it is to capture the import of what's been happening now, you know, set it to music, art. Right? It could be a yeah. book, for you it's music, for other people it could be a movie, it could be a screenplay, yeah. it could be anything. And then you capture it and then that's there forever. You know, and people can look back on this time and, and s emotionally study it. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and I, you know, you kind of, you feel it personally as well, because you reflect on, on the work that you've done and, and yeah. what, what were you feeling at that time or what were your emotions? You know, it might yeah. be personal emotions and kind of the messages in the, in the, the work that I've done. You know, there's two albums there and an EP. And, you know, the first album was just genuine excitement to be able to be actually doing something I'd always dreamed of doing. So yeah, yeah. It was a little bit of a mishmash of, of everything right. I could possibly think of. And then the second time around, I think, got a little bit more considered, um, but it was still a, an air of excitement about it. But there was a feeling when I look back on that now of, um, I was volunteering in a homeless shelter um, in, in my hometown for young people. Okay. And I met, some, I met some incredible people in there and I... I I had some time, I took some time off work to, to just concentrate on playing music and writing. And um, I also wrote, it's funny you say about the screenplay, I wrote a play, a musical about homelessness called wow. Streets, of, Streets of Your Town. And it was almost like a story that could be played out in Blackpool, my hometown, but it's, it's universal. It could be played out in London, it could be played out in New York, you know. It's right. a story that, that is happening everywhere. And so... When you say that, I look back to a couple of years ago about that period where I felt I was capturing something that was specifically going on in my town. But sadly, you know, it's still a huge problem wherever right. you go and, and particularly in New York. So it's still applicable now. So, right. and, and that's uh, the, the relevance of what you're doing now and what you've done, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I mean... I think it's more about just, you know, tr trying to raise some awareness as well, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Because people um, choose their way of looking at the world and, and, and maybe when things are okay for them, they don't specifically want to be looking out at what other people are having problems with or wrestling with. And, and there was um, the album, the last album was called There Is Always Hope. And, uh, kind of like Promise, right? Kind of like your yeah, name. Yeah, and, and, and it, was, it was so interesting because it was partly because my sister... Uh, she probably will never watch this, so I can talk about it. She, she'd she been talking about my work in the homeless shelter, and I thought she was positive about it. And she was saying how in her town, you know, she wrote to the mayor about the homeless problem, and there's lots of people sleeping rough in uh, shop doorways, store doorways, and what have you. Um, but she was actually writing to the mayor to complain that it shouldn't be happening in her town. <laughs> you know, not that we should be doing anything about it, Right, but right. This is wrong. We are not the the other town, which is Blackpool, which is much more you know working class. This is a much more affluent area. We shouldn't be experiencing this. So, so yeah. that was one thing about wait, you know, open your eyes to what the problem is. But I also um, I went to Glasgow when my daughter was at university, and uh, it was a Monday night. It was a really rainy, sort of drizzly, dreek night, as they would right. call it. In Aren't they all like that over there? They're all like that. That's a summer evening, actually, in, in Scotland. Right. It's a beautiful and, uh, summer night. Yeah, it was actually January. And you can imagine there was hardly anyone about middle of January, uh, eight o'clock in the evening. I was waiting for a train and um, the central station is right in the center of town. And I, um, I, was, I was just walking to the station and I heard uh, uh, somebody singing, like somebody busking. and It was amplified. And I followed it because it sounded gorgeous. It was quite a haunting sort of melody. And it was a guy right. playing. And he was playing amplified uh, voice and his guitar. But it was absolutely beautiful. And um, he, it turns out he was from Eastern Europe. 
and uh, he could barely speak English, but he was just smiling like, and, and he was, I, I worked out from him that he was over in, in Scotland. He thought he had some family in Liverpool or in London and he was trying to get money together to go and, and look for them. Um, but he kind of had nothing and he was playing. There was nobody around. It was, you know, barely 40 Just for the joy of the music. And he was playing and, and all he could say while he was smiling, this was the, I swear, this is the only thing he actually said that I could understand. There is always hope. Wow. wow. And that was like, to me, was just so powerful. Wow. And I thought, if this guy who's got nothing mm. in a country where he knows no one, yeah. uh, can sit playing his guitar in the middle of the town centre in the dead of night uh, in winter, but he's smiling and there's always hope and, you know, come on, let's go. We let's stay positive. Then, wow! If he can do it, we all can. Yeah, you you just so a couple of things. First of all, as is always the case on our show, time friggin' flies. Um, <laughs> I just looked at my clock on my computer. We we've been chatting for forty minutes, and it feels like five. And, and a, yeah, and pleasure. secondly, what a great positive way to sort of round things out. Um, I, I could talk to you for hours and maybe someday in real life we will. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope yeah. so. You never know. But no, I appreciate it. it. It's great to talk to you and even just reflect because, you know, we're, as you say, we're of a certain age, aren't we? And uh, yeah. we're, we're, we don't often talk about some of these things and some of the, the kind of influences. And it's got me just having the conversation has, has kind of got me thinking, well, so I, yeah, how did we get here? You know? Yeah. Well, I, well, I love did it come to this. I love, you know, we've, I, I love our chats on this show about the artistic process. And I keep coming back uh, to this wonderful guy, Alex Scooby, who is a guitar player. And that was our excuse to put him on, but he's really an actor. Um, right. And, we, and we, we put him on Zoom. So he was one of our earlier Zoom shows. He said the exact same things you're saying. He keeps himself sane with creative projects. For him, it's writing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a shitty screenplay under my belt. Um, yeah. Because I only wrote one. They say you have to write five to be good. Um, right. Okay. But um, but he t he he was an actor version of you. So wow. you know what you know. I love that we can talk on this show about sort of the human artistic process and, and how these times these times where I can't have you in the studio, which I'd prefer. Yeah. You know um, how how you can make them great in a sense because. I, I think that what I'm hearing from a lot of the, the folks we chat with is that it's almost like there's a spike in creativity because of this forced solitude. Are yeah. you feeling that? Um, I, I, yes, for me personally, but I, I know friends of mine who have gone exactly the, the other way. Yeah. I think I, I, the one thing I'll say to that, that there's also something about working keeps you sharp. And, you know, it's like, a bit like the old uh, Woody Guthrie and um, in Bound for Glory, which is an incredible book where about, you know, stay hard, stay hungry, stay alive, all that kind of stuff, which Bruce right. picked up on. But there is something about that because I did take a bit of time off work um, in between projects. I, I work in design and construction. Okay. And, uh, and it was basically, you almost sometimes have too much time. Mm -hmm. And I found, yeah. I found that towards the end of that period, I went a little bit soggy and nothing really happened. And mm -hmm. I felt like a little bit like jelly, you know? Yeah. Where, where when, I, when I was thinking when I came to New York and I started work again, I'm never going to have time to be writing music. or but, I, but the actual energy that I got from being involved working again and working with people and being part of a team actually sparked right. creativity as well. So... You, you need to strike a balance. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, if you're working, life is happening to you. And, yeah. You know, and, yeah. you know, like I'll, I'll, the other day, I'm, I'm a lawyer by day. That's what I, you know, that's, okay. a, that's what keeps my lights on. And I spent nine straight hours in front of my computer in one day writing a 30 page brief, you wow. know, and, I, and, and that you could lose your mind doing that. Sure. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I'll sometimes hop in the car and drive. I, there's a river near me and I'll just look at the river for a little bit. And then I feel a little rejuvenated. And do you, you write know. as well? Um, I, I have a, I, I wrote about six chapters of a book yeah. <laughs> that went nowhere. And I wrote a really objectively bad screenplay. Right. Um, but songs, sorry, in, in, in you, you don't put that to your own songs. 
Now I've written, I have probably, I think I wrote two or three songs in my songwriting wow. career. <laughs> so I do have a couple of songs under my belt, but you know, for, from a musician point of view, I was garage bands in high school, bands in college, bands in law school. And I like to play now, but I'm, you yeah. know, I'm always clear on the show. I'm on a very different level than my guests. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'm comfortable on guitar, but not at the same level. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I think that's the point is what what you love and what you enjoy yeah. about the process. And for me, I would love to be there's a guy who I really admire, uh, War on Drugs, the band. Um, and, and he writes all his music and he produces it and he records yeah. it himself at home. And I would love to be able to do that, but I just haven't got the patience uh, and the yeah. chops to be able to do all the technology. So whilst I would love to be able to do it, I'm not going to waste any energy in trying to master it because I just, I'm not wired that way. Right. And, that, and, what I love doing is writing and, and creating. So I'll leave it to somebody else to do the technology and, and I'll do yeah. what I love, which is, you know, sitting on a bench coming up with lyrics or, playing the piano in the dark and coming up with a melody or plugging a guitar in and seeing what, you know, crash out a few chords and rhythm and see what happens. That's where, that's where I get my energy from. Yeah. And, and I could say with a hundred percent certainty, having chatted with you for a while now, everything you do is authentic. I could just tell. And, and, <laughs> and that's in the same line, you know, I'm more familiar with Bruce than with Joe Strummer, but you're doing it right. You know, um, and, and if you emote organically, you create the great works you're already doing. So you're going to, you know, when, when, when you're eventually able to be around people again, you're going to have, I'm sure you're wrong that there's only two or three good songs out of the 40 or 50. There's <laughs> probably at least 10 or 15. You're yeah, going to have a whole maybe. catalog of really good stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah, I, I hope so. And I, and I think, as, as we said before, it's almost like it's a way of capturing this moment, isn't it? So yeah it's a way of documenting it it's almost like a diary entry this was me in in 2020 um, yeah. and you know the first album was 2017 and i make some references to 2017 that, that i i can picture that was a, a certain time you know we had terrorist attacks in in uh, in the uk and all right yeah elements, elements of that was picked up so the, the music, I listen to the music and it takes me to that place. And, and I quite like that out of the artists that I admire and that I listen to. So if I can do a fraction of that, then, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm confident you will. So let me ask one last question. So you're Johnny Bullen and the Promise. I, I already know the answer, but I want you to tell us. How do people find you? Well, we can be found on all of the major platforms, you know, the usual uh, on Spotify and Apple Music, uh, YouTube. I'll be honest, and I think I mentioned it to you in our initial correspondence, yeah. you know, a bit like the technology, I am hopeless at keeping up to date with social media. You know, you kind of, it's, it's that thing, that kind of passed us by, didn't it, in many respects? Oh, it did. It's yeah, like, I, I'm worthless on Instagram. I don't even understand it. I'm on yeah, it a little bit. I don't get it. Yeah, I don't do that either, but um, it, it's it's unfortunate uh, that that's the way it goes. But um, you know, I'm I'm just happy that the music's out there. It's on, as I say, it's on Spotify. It's uh, it's on Apple Music. Uh, we even have uh, CDs. You know, we actually did some CDs. What are those? For those people that still have a CD player. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I still buy CDs and vinyl, and I'll I'll never stop doing it. And and for me, it's unfortunate that people only ever maybe listen to a track, you know, we yeah. would have, never have got into a band like the clash that would have been so important to us in our lives. If yeah. we only listened to a, one song. No, you know, I know. We, and just the tactile bought, feel of the cardboard of the album yeah, cover. We bought yeah. into everything that they stood for, you know? So yeah. I think um, obviously that part is lost, but you know, the music's still out there and I still love playing live. And when that day comes, there's no better feeling than, than, I mean, I always love playing in a covers band, but there's no better feeling than playing live to yeah. your songs and putting yeah. your music out there. I um, will come see you at Maxwell's if it's still exists. <laughs> Maxwell's still no, around? Do you know, it's funny. I nearly, I nearly mentioned Maxwell's earlier as, as how things have moved on. Believe it or not, I saw a note that came through today on one of the local emails or something that um, it's now turned into a seafood restaurant. Oh, no. 
it's just about to open. I'm like, what's going on with the world? Oh no! I was I. All I could say is, when I was at Maxwell's over 20 years ago, I don't remember when I was at Maxwell's over 20 years ago. It was one of those kind of nights. <laughs> yeah. But um, this has been absolutely wonderful. I, I've really enjoyed you on the show. This Thanks. is great. And, Thanks, and, it's been great. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. So you have a wonderful night. I'm going to uh, hit stop on the recording which I don't need to say. I should just do it, but that's how we are here. All right, goodbye, everyone, and have a great night. We'll see you next time on Guitar Tales.